this librivox recording is in the public domain psychology of the unconscious by carl jung part two chapter seven the dual mother role after the disappearance of the assailant chawantapal begins the following monologue from the extreme ends of these continents from the farthest lowlands after having forsaken the palace of my father i have been wandering aimlessly during a hundred moons always pursued by my mad desire to find her who will understand with jewels i have tempted many fair ones with kisses i have tried to snatch the secret of their hearts with acts of bravery i have conquered their admiration he reviews the women he has known chita the princess of my race she is a little fool vain as a peacock having naught in her head but jewels and perfume tanan the young peasant ba a mere sow no more than a breast and a stomach caring only for pleasure and then ki ma the priestess a true parrot repeating hollow phrases learnt from the priests all for show without real education or sincerity suspicious poseur and hypocrite alas not one who understands me not one who resembles me not one who has a soul sister to mine there is not one among them all who has known my soul not one who could read my thought far from it not one capable of seeking with me the luminous summits or of spelling with me the superhuman word love here chawantapal himself says that his journeying and wandering is a quest for that other and for the meaning of life which lies in union with her in the first part of this work we merely hinted gently at this possibility the fact that the seeker is masculine and the sought for of feminine sex is not so astonishing because the chief object of the unconscious transference is the mother as has probably been seen from that which we have already learned the daughter takes a male attitude towards the mother the genesis of this adjustment can only be suspected in our case because objective proof is lacking therefore let us rather be satisfied with inferences she who will understand means the mother in the infantile language at the same time it also means the life's companion as is well known the sex contrast concerns the libido but little the sex of the object plays a surprisingly slight role in the estimation of the unconscious the object itself taken as an objective reality is but of slight significance but it is of greatest importance whether the libido is transferred or introverted the original concrete meaning of erfassen to seize begreifen to touch etc allows us to recognize clearly the underside of the wish to find a congenial person but the upper intellectual half is also contained in it and is to be taken into account at the same time one might be inclined to assume this tendency if it were not that our culture abused the same for the misunderstood woman has become almost proverbial which can only be the result of a wholly distorted valuation on the one side our culture undervalues most extraordinarily the importance of sexuality on the other side sexuality breaks out as a direct result of the repression burdening it at every place where it does not belong and makes use of such an indirect manner of expression that one may expect to meet it suddenly almost anywhere thus the idea 
of the intimate comprehension of a human soul which is in reality something very beautiful and pure is soiled and disagreeably distorted through the entrance of the indirect sexual meaning the secondary meaning or better expressed the misuse which repressed and denied sexuality forces upon the highest soul functions makes it possible for example for certain of our opponents to scent in psychoanalysis purient erotic confessionals these are subjective wish fulfilment deliria which need no contra arguments this misuse makes the wish to be understood highly suspicious if the natural demands of life have not been fulfilled nature has first claim on man only long afterwards does the luxury of intellect come the mediaeval ideal of life for the sake of death needs gradually to be replaced by a natural conception of life in which the normal demands of men are thoroughly kept in mind so that the desires of the animal sphere may no longer be compelled to drag down into their service the high gifts of the intellectual sphere in order to find an outlet we are inclined therefore to consider the dreamer's wish for understanding first of all as a repressed striving towards the natural destiny this meaning coincides absolutely with psychoanalytic experience that there are countless neurotic people who apparently are prevented from experiencing life because they have an unconscious and often also a conscious repugnance to the sexual fate under which they imagine all kinds of ugly things there is only too great an inclination to yield to this pressure of the unconscious sexuality and to experience the dreaded unconsciously hoped for disagreeable sexual experience so as to acquire by that means a legitimately founded horror which retains them more surely in the infantile situation this is the reason why so many people fall into that very state towards which they have the greatest abhorrence that we were correct in our assumption that in miss miller it is a question of the battle for independence is shown by her statement that the hero's departure from his father's house reminds her of the fate of the young buddha who likewise renounced all luxury to which he was born in order to go out into the world to live out his destiny to its completion buddha gave the same heroic example as did christ who separated from his mother and even spoke bitter words matthew chapter ten five thirty four think not that i am come to send peace on earth i came not to send peace but a sword thirty five for i am come to set a man at variance against his father and the daughter against her mother and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law thirty six and a man's foes shall be they of his own household thirty seven he that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me or luke chapter twelve five fifty one suppose ye that i am come to give peace on earth i tell you nay but rather division fifty two for from henceforth there shall be five in one house divided three against two and two against three fifty three the father shall be divided against the son and the son against the father the mother against the daughter and the daughter against the mother the mother-in-law against the daughter-in-law and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law horace snatched from his mother her head adornment the power just as adam struggled with lilith so he struggles for power nietzsche inhuman all too human expressed the same in very beautiful words one may suppose that a mind in which the type of free mind is to ripen and sweeten at maturity has had its decisive crisis in a great detachment so that before this time 
it was just so much the more a fettered spirit and appeared chained for ever to its corner and its pillar what binds it most firmly what cords are almost unterrible among human beings of a high and exquisite type it would be duties that reverence which is suitable for you that modesty and tenderness for all the old honoured and valued things that thankfulness for the earth from which they grew or the hand which guided them for the shrine where they learnt to pray their loftiest moments themselves come to bind them the firmest to obligate them the most permanently the great detachment comes suddenly for people so bound better to die than to live here thus rings the imperative voice of seduction and this here this at home is all that it the soul has loved until now a sudden terror and suspicion against that which it has loved a lightning flash of scorn towards that which is called duty a rebellious arbitrary volcanic impelling desire for travelling for strange countries estrangements coolness frigidity disillusionments a hatred of love perhaps a sacrilegious touch and glance backwards there where just now it adored and loved perhaps a blush of shame over what it has just done and at the same time an exultation over having done it an intoxicating internal joyous thrill in which a victory reveals itself a victory over what over whom an enigmatic doubtful questioning victory but the first triumph of such woe and pain is formed the history of the great detachment it is like a disease which can destroy men this first eruption of strength and will towards self-assertion the danger lies as is brilliantly expressed by nietzsche in isolation in one's self solitude surrounds and embraces him ever more threatening ever more constricting ever more heart strangling the terrible goddess and mater thywa cupidinum the libido taken away from the mother who is abandoned only reluctantly becomes threatening as a serpent the symbol of death for the relation to the mother must cease must die which itself almost causes man's death in mater saiwa cupidinum the idea attains rare almost conscious perfection i do not presume to try to paint in better words than has nietzsche the psychology of the wrench from childhood miss miller furnishes us with a further reference to a material which has influenced her creation in a more general manner this is the great indian epic of longfellow the song of hiawatha if my readers have had patience to read thus far and to reflect upon what they have read they frequently must have wondered at the number of times i introduced for comparison such apparently foreign material and how often i widened the base upon which miss miller's creations rest doubts must often have arisen whether it is justifiable to enter into important discussions concerning the psychologic foundations of myths religions and culture in general on the basis of such scanty suggestions it might be said that behind the miller fantasies such a thing is scarcely to be found i need hardly emphasize the fact that i too have sometimes been in doubt i had never read hiawatha until in the course of my work i came to this part hiawatha a poetical compilation of indian myths gives me however a justification for all preceding reflections because this epic contains an unusual number of mythologic problems this fact is probably of great importance for the wealth of suggestions in the miller fantasies we are therefore compelled to obtain an insight into this epic nawadaha 
sings the songs of the epic of the hero hiawatha the friend of man there he sang of hiawatha sang the songs of hiawatha sang his wondrous birth and being how he prayed and how he fasted how he lived and toiled and suffered that the tribes of men might prosper that he might advance his people the teleological meaning of the hero as that symbolic figure which unites in itself libido in the form of admiration and adoration in order to lead to higher sublimations by way of the symbolic bridges of the myths is anticipated here thus we become quickly acquainted with hiawatha as a saviour and are prepared to hear all that which must be said of a saviour of his marvellous birth of his early great deeds and his sacrifice for his fellow-men the first song begins with a fragment of evangelism gitcha nanita the master of life tired of the quarrels of his human children calls his people together and makes known to them the joyous message i will send a prophet to you a deliverer of the nations who shall guide you and shall teach you who shall toil and suffer with you if you listen to his counsels you will multiply and prosper if his warnings pass unheeded you will fade away and perish gitcha manito the mighty the creator of the nations is represented as he stood erect on the great red pipestone quarry from his footprints flowed a river leaped into the light of morning or the precipice plunging downward gleamed like ishkuda the comet the water flowing from his footsteps sufficiently proves the phallic nature of this creator i refer to the earlier utterances concerning the phallic and fertilizing nature of the horse's foot and the horse's steps and especially do i recall hippocrene and the foot of pegasus we meet with the same idea in psalm sixty five twenty nine to eleven thou visitest the earth and waterest it thou makest it very plenteous the river of god is full of water thou preparest their corn for so thou providest for the earth thou waterest her furrows thou sendest rain into the little valleys thereof thou makest it soft with the drops of rain and blessest the increase of it thou crownest the year with thy goodness and thy paths drop fatness wherever the fertilizing god steps there is fruitfulness we already have spoken of the symbolic meaning of treading in discussing the nightmares caeneus passes into the depths splitting the earth with a foot outstretched amphiaraus another chthonic hero sinks into the earth which zeus has opened for him by a stroke of lightning compare with that the above-mentioned vision of a hysterical patient who saw a black horse after a flash of lightning identity of horse's footstep and flash of lightning by means of a flash of lightning heroes were made immortal faust detained the mothers when he stamped his foot stamp and descend stamping thou'lt rise again the heroes in the sun-devouring myths often stamp at or struggle in the jaws of the monster thus tor stamped through the ship's bottom in battle with the monster and went as far as the bottom of the sea caeneus concerning kicking as an infantile fantasy see above the regression of the libido to the pre-sexual stage makes this preparatory action of treading either a substitution for the coitus fantasy or for the fantasy of re-entrance into the mother's womb the comparison of water flowing from the footsteps with a comet is a light symbolism for the fructifying moisture sperma according to an observation by humboldt cosmos certain south american indian tribes call the meteors urine of the stars mention is also made of how gitche manito makes fire he blows upon a forest 
so that the trees rubbing upon each other burst into flame this demon is therefore an excellent libido symbol he also produced fire after this prologue in the second song the hero's previous history is related the great warrior mud jerkiwis hiawatha's father has cunningly overcome the great bear the terror of the nations and stolen from him the magic belt of wampum a girdle of shells here we meet the motive of the treasure attained with difficulty which the hero rescues from the monster who the bear is is shown by the poet's comparisons mudjukiwis strikes the bear on his head after he has robbed him of the treasure with the heavy blow bewildered rose the great bear of the mountains but his knees beneath him trembled and he whimpered like a woman mudji kiwis said derisively to him else you would not cry and whimper like a miserable woman but you bear sit here and whimper and disgrace your tribe by crying like a wretched shogadaya like a cowardly old woman these three comparisons with a woman are to be found near each other on the same page mudjikiwis has like a true hero once more torn life from the jaws of death from the all-devouring terrible mother this deed which as we have seen is also represented as a journey to hell night journey through the sea the conquering of the monster from within signifies at the same time entrance into the mother's womb a rebirth the results of which are perceptible also for mudjikiwis as in the zosimos vision here too the entering one becomes the breath of the wind or spirit mudjikiwis becomes the west wind the fertilizing breath the father of winds his sons become the other winds an intermezzo tells of them and of their love stories of which i will mention only the courtship of wabins the east wind because here the erotic wooing of the wind is pictured in an especially beautiful manner every morning he sees a beautiful girl in a meadow whom he eagerly courts every morning gazing earthward still the first thing he beheld there was her blue eyes looking at him two blue lakes among the rushes the comparison with water is not a matter of secondary importance because from wind and water shall man be born anew and he wooed her with caresses wooed her with his smile of sunshine with his flattering words he wooed her with his sighing and his singing gentlest whispers in the branches softest music sweetest odors etc in these onomato poetic verses the wind's caressing courtship is excellently expressed the third song presents the previous history of hiawatha's mother his grandmother when a maiden lived in the moon there she once swung upon a liana but a jealous lover cut off the liana and nokomis hiawatha's grandmother fell to earth the people who saw her fall downwards thought that she was a shooting star this marvellous descent of nokomis is more plainly illustrated by a later passage of this same song there little hiawatha asks the grandmother what is the moon nokomis teaches him about it as follows the moon is the body of a grandmother whom a warlike grandson has cast up there in wrath hence the moon is the grandmother in ancient beliefs the moon is also the gathering place of departed souls the guardian of seeds therefore once more a place of the origin of life of predominantly feminine significance the remarkable thing is that nokomis falling upon the earth gave birth to a daughter winona subsequently the mother of hiawatha the throwing upwards of the mother and her following down and bringing forth seems to contain something typical in itself thus a story of the seventeenth century relates that a mad bull threw a pregnant woman as high as a house and tore open her womb and the child fell without harm upon the earth 
on account of his wonderful birth this child was considered a hero or doer of miracles but he died at an early age the belief is widespread among lower savages that the sun is feminine and the moon masculine among the namaqua a hottentot tribe the opinion is prevalent that the sun consists of transparent bacon the people who journey on boats draw it down by magic every evening cut off a suitable piece and then give it a kick so that it flies up again into the sky Vites anthropology two three forty two the infantile nourishment comes from the mother in the gnostic fantasies we come across a legend of the origin of man which possibly belongs here the female archons bound to the vault of heaven are unable on account of its quick rotation to keep their young within them but let them fall upon the earth from which men arise possibly there is here a connection with barbaric midwifery the letting fall of the parturient the assault upon the mother is already introduced with the adventure of Majikiwis, and is continued in the violent handling of the grandmother nokomis who as a result of the cutting of the liana and the fall downwards seems in some way to have become pregnant the cutting of the branch the plucking we have already recognized as mother incest see above that well-known verse saxon land where beautiful maidens grow upon trees and phrases like picking cherries in a neighbor's garden allude to a similar idea the fall downwards of nokomis deserves to be compared to a poetical figure in heine a star a star is falling out of the glittering sky the star of love i watch it sink in the depths and die the leaves and buds are falling from many an apple tree i watch the mirthful breezes embrace them wantonly winona later was courted by the caressing west wind and becomes pregnant winona as a young moon goddess has the beauty of the moonlight nokomis warns her of the dangerous courtship of Majikiwas, the west wind but winona allows herself to become infatuated and conceives from the breath of the wind from the bena a son our hero and the west wind came at evening found the beautiful winona lying there amid the lilies wooed her with his words of sweetness wooed her with his soft caresses till she bore a son in sorrow bore a son of love and sorrow fertilization through the breath of the spirit is already a well-known precedent for us the star or comet plainly belongs to the birth scene as a libido symbol nokomis too comes to earth as a shooting star Murica's sweet poetic fantasy has devised a similar divine origin and she who bore me in her womb and gave me food and clothing she was a maid a wild brown maid who looked on men with loathing she fleered at them and laughed out loud and bade no suitor tarry i'd rather be the wind's own bride than have a man and marry then came the wind and held her fast his captive love enchanted and lo by him a merry child within her womb was planted buddha's marvellous birth story retold by sir edwin arnold also shows traces of this maya the queen dreamed a strange dream dreamed that a star from heaven splendid six-rayed in colour rosy pearl whereof the token was an elephant six tusked and white as milk of kamadhuk shot through the void and shining into her entered her womb upon the right during maya's conception a wind blows over the land a wind blew with unknown freshness over lands and seas after the birth the four genii of the east west south and north come to render service as bearers of the palanquin the coming of the wise men at christ's birth we also find here a distinct reference to the four winds for the completion of the symbolism there is to be found in the buddha myth as well as in the birth legend of christ besides the impregnation by star and wind 
also the fertilization by an animal here an elephant which with its phallic trunk fulfilled in maya the christian method of fructification through the ear or the head it is well known that in addition to the dove the unicorn is also a procreative symbol of the logos here arises the question why the birth of a hero always had to take place under such strange symbolic circumstances it might also be imagined that a hero arose from ordinary surroundings and gradually grew out of his inferior environment perhaps with a thousand troubles and dangers and indeed this motive is by no means strange in the hero myth it might be said that superstition demands strange conditions of birth and generation but why does it demand them the answer to this question is that the birth of the hero as a rule is not that of an ordinary mortal but is a rebirth from the mother spouse hence it occurs under mysterious ceremonies therefore in the very beginning lies the motive of the two mothers of the hero as ranc has shown us through many examples the hero is often obliged to experience exposure and upbringing by foster parents and in this manner he acquires the two mothers a striking example is the relation of hercules to hera in the hiawatha epic winona dies after the birth and acomas takes her place maya dies after the birth and buddha is given a stepmother the stepmother is sometimes an animal the she-wolf of romulus and remus etc the twofold mother may be replaced by the motive of twofold birth which has attained a lofty significance in the christian mythology namely through baptism which as we have seen represents rebirth thus man is born not merely in a commonplace manner but also born again in a mysterious manner by means of which he becomes a participator of the kingdom of god of immortality any one may become a hero in this way who is generated anew through his own mother because only through her does he share in immortality therefore it happened that the death of christ on the cross which creates universal salvation was understood as baptism that is to say as rebirth through the second mother the mysterious tree of death christ says but i have a baptism to be baptized with and how am i straitened till it be accomplished luke twelve fifty he interprets his death agony symbolically as birth agony the motive of the two mothers suggests the thought of self-rejuvenation and evidently expresses the fulfilment of the wish that it might be possible for the mother to bear me again at the same time applied to the heroes it means one is a hero who is born again by her who has previously been his mother that is to say a hero is he who may again produce himself through his mother the countless suggestions in the history of the procreation of the heroes indicate the latter formulations hiawatha's father first overpowered the mother under the symbol of the bear then himself becoming a god he procreates the hero what hiawatha has to do as hero nokomis hinted to him in the legend of the origin of the moon he is forcibly to throw his mother upwards or throw downwards then she would become pregnant by this act of violence and could bring forth a daughter this rejuvenated mother would be allotted according to the egyptian rite as a daughter wife to the sun god the father of his mother for self reproduction what action hiawatha takes in this regard we shall see presently we have already studied the behaviour of the pre-asiatic gods related to christ concerning the pre-existence of christ the gospel of st john is full of this thought thus the speech of john the baptist this is he of whom i said after me cometh a man which is preferred before me for he was before me john one thirty also the beginning of the gospel is full of deep mythologic significance in the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was god the same was in the beginning with god 
three all things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made four in him was life and the life was the light of men five and the light shineth in darkness and the darkness comprehendeth it not six there was a man sent from god whose name was john seven the same came for a witness to bear witness of the light eight he was not that light but was sent to bear witness of that light nine that was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world this is the proclamation of the reappearing light the reborn son which formerly was and which will be again in the baptistry at pisa christ is represented bringing the tree of life to man his head is surrounded by a sun halo over this relief stand the words in troitus solus because the one born was his own procreator the history of the, his procreation is strangely concealed under symbolic events which are meant to conceal and deny it hence the extraordinary assertion of the virgin conception this is meant to hide the incestuous impregnation but do not let us forget that this naive assertion plays an unusually important part in the ingenious symbolic bridge which is to guide the libido out from the incestuous bond to higher and more useful applications which indicate a new kind of immortality that is to say immortal work the environment of hiawatha's youth is of importance by the shores of gichigumi by the shining big sea water stood the wigwam of nokomis daughter of the moon nokomis dark behind it rose the forest rose the black and gloomy pine trees rose the firs with cones upon them bright before it beat the water beat the clear and sunny water beat the shining big sea water in this environment nokomis brought him up here she taught him the first words and told him the first fairy tales and the sounds of the water and the wood were intermingled so that the child learned not only to understand man's speech but also that of nature at the door on summer evenings sat the little hiawatha heard the whispering of the pine trees heard the lapping of the water sounds of music words of wonder mini wawa said the pine trees mudwe aushka said the water hiawatha hears human speech in the sounds of nature thus he understands nature's speech the wind says wawa the cry of the wild goose is wawa wa wa tesi means the small glow-worm which enchants him thus the poet paints most beautifully the gradual gathering of external nature into the compass of the subjective and the intimate connection of the primary object to which the first lisping words were applied and from which the first sounds were derived with the secondary object the wider nature which usurps imperceptibly the mother's place and takes possession of those sounds heard first from the mother and also of those feelings which we all discover later in ourselves in all the warm love of mother nature the later blending whether pantheistic philosophic or aesthetic of the sentimental cultured man with nature is looked at retrospectively a reblending with the mother who was our primary object and with whom we truly were once wholly one therefore it is not astonishing when we again see emerging in the poetical speech of a modern philosopher carl joel the old pictures which symbolize the unity with the mother illustrated by the confluence of subject and object in his recent book seal und welt nineteen twelve joel writes as follows in the chapter called primal experience i lay on the seashore the shining waters glittering in my dreamy eyes at a great distance fluttered the soft breeze throbbing shimmering stirring lulling to sleep comes the wave beat to the shore or to the ear i know not distance and nearness become blurred into one without and within glide into each other nearer and nearer dearer and more homelike sounds the beating of the waves now like a thundering pulse in my head it strikes and now it beats over my soul devours it embraces it 
while it itself at the same time floats out like the blue waste of waters yes without and within are one glistening and foaming flowing and fanning and roaring the entire symphony of the stimuli experience sounds in one tone all thought becomes one thought which becomes one with feeling the world exhales in the soul and the soul dissolves in the world our small life is encircled by a great sleep the sleep of our cradle the sleep of our grave the sleep of our home from which we go forth in the morning to which we again return in the evening our life but the short journey the interval between the emergence from the original oneness and the sinking back into it blue shimmers the infinite sea wherein dreams the jellyfish of the primitive life toward which without ceasing our thoughts hark back dimly through eons of existence for every happening entails a change and a guarantee of the unity of life at that moment when they are no longer blended together in that instant man lifts his head blind and dripping from the depths of the stream of experience from the oneness with the experience at that moment of parting when the unity of life in startled surprise detaches the change and holds it away from itself as something alien at this moment of alienation the aspects of the experience have been substantialized into subject and object and in that moment consciousness is born joel paints here in unmistakable symbolism the confluence of subject and object as the reunion of mother and child the symbols agree with those of mythology even in their details the encircling and devouring motive is distinctly suggested the sea devouring the sun and giving birth to it anew is already an old acquaintance the moment of the rise of consciousness the separation of subject and object is a birth truly philosophical thought hangs with lame wings upon the few great primitive pictures of human speech above the simple all-surpassing greatness of which no thought can rise the idea of the jellyfish is not accidental once when i was explaining to a patient the maternal significance of water at this contact with the mother complex she experienced a very unpleasant feeling it makes me squirm she said as if i touched a jellyfish here too the same idea the blessed state of sleep before birth and after death is as joel observed something like old shadowy memories of that unsuspecting thoughtless state of early childhood where as yet no opposition disturbed the peaceful flow of dawning life to which the inner longing always draws us back again and again and from which the active life must free itself anew with struggle and death so that it may not be doomed to destruction long before joel an indian chieftain had said the same thing in similar words to one of the restless wise men ah my brother you will never learn to know the happiness of thinking nothing and doing nothing this is next to sleep this is the most delightful thing there is thus we were before birth thus we shall be after death we shall see in hiawatha's later fate how important his early impressions are in his choice of a wife hiawatha's first deed was to kill a roebuck with his arrow dead he lay there in the forest by the ford across the river this is typical of hiawatha's deeds whatever he kills for the most part lies next to or in the water sometimes half in the water and half on the land it seems that this must well be so the later adventures will teach us why this must be so the buck was no ordinary animal but a magic one that is to say one with an additional unconscious significance hiawatha made for himself gloves and moccasins from its hide the gloves imparted such strength to his arms that he could crumble rocks to dust and the moccasins had the virtue of the seven league boots by enwrapping himself in the buck's skin he really became a giant this motive together with the death of the animal at the fort in the water reveals the fact that the parents are concerned whose gigantic proportions as compared with the child are of great significance in the unconscious the toys of giants is a wish inversion of the infantile fantasy the dream of an eleven-year-old girl expresses it i am as high as a church steeple then a policeman comes i tell him if you say anything i will cut off your head the policeman as the analysis brought out 
referred to the father whose gigantic size was overcompensated by the church steeple in mexican human sacrifices the gods were represented by criminals who were slaughtered and flayed and the corybantes then clothed themselves in the bloody skins in order to illustrate the resurrection of the gods the snake's casting of his skin as a symbol of rejuvenation hiawatha has therefore conquered his parents primarily the mother although in the form of a male animal compare the bear of mudchikewis and from that comes his giant strength he has taken on the parent's skin and now has himself become a great man now he started forth to his first great battle to fight with the father mudjikewis in order to avenge his dead mother winona naturally under this figure of speech hides the thought that he slays the father in order to take possession of the mother compare the battle of gilgamesh with the giant chumbaba and the ensuing conquest of ishtar the father in the psychologic sense merely represents the personification of the incest prohibition that is to say resistance which defends the mother instead of the father it may be a fearful animal the great bear the snake the dragon etc which must be fought and overcome the hero is a hero because he sees in every difficulty of life resistance to the forbidden treasure and fights that resistance with the complete yearning which strives towards the treasure attainable with difficulty or unattainable the yearning which paralyzes and kills the ordinary man hiawatha's father is mudjikewis the west wind the battle therefore takes place in the west thence came life impregnation of winona thence also came death death of winona hiawatha therefore fights the typical battle of the hero for rebirth in the western sea the battle with the devouring terrible mother this time in the form of the father mudjikewis who himself had acquired a divine nature through his conquest of the bear now is overpowered by his son back retreated mudjikewis rushing westward o'er the mountains stumbling westward down the mountains three whole days retreated fighting still pursued by hiawatha to the doorways of the west wind to the portals of the sunset to the earth's remotest border where into the empty spaces sinks the sun as, as a flamingo drops into her nest at nightfall the three days are a stereotype form representing the stay in the sea prison of night twenty first until twenty fourth of december christ too remained three days in the underworld the treasure difficult to attain is captured by the hero during this struggle in the west in this case the father must make a great concession to the son he gives him divine nature that very wind nature the immortality of which alone protected mudjikewis from death he says to his son i will share my kingdom with you ruler shall you be henceforward of the northwest wind ki waden of the home wind the ki waden that hiawatha now becomes the ruler of the home wind has its close parallel in the gilgamesh epic where gilgamesh finally receives the magic herb from the wise old utnapishtim who dwells in the west which brings him safe once more over the sea to his home but this when he is home again is retaken from him by a serpent when one has slain the father one can obtain possession of his wife and when one has conquered the mother one can free oneself on the return journey hiawatha stops at the clever arrow makers who possesses a lovely daughter and he named her from the river from the waterfall he named her minnehaha laughing water when hiawatha in his earliest childhood dreaming felt the sounds of water and wind press upon his ears he recognized in these sounds of nature the speech of his mother the murmuring pine trees on the shore of the great sea said many wawa and above the murmuring of the winds and the splashing of the water he found his earliest childhood dreams once again in a woman minnehaha the laughing water and the hero before all others finds in woman the mother in order to become a child again and finally to solve the riddle of immortality the fact that minnehaha's father is a skilful arrow-maker 
betrays him as the father of the hero and the woman he had with him as the mother the father of the hero is very often a skilful carpenter or other artisan according to an arabian legend tara abraham's father was a skilful master workman who could carve arrows from any wood that is to say in the arabian form of speech he was a procreator of splendid sons moreover he was a maker of images of gods tabashtar agni's father is the maker of the world a smith and carpenter the discoverer of fire boring joseph the father of jesus was also a carpenter likewise kinyaris adonis's father who is said to have invented the hammer the lever roofing and mining hephaestus the father of hermes is an artistic master workman and sculptor in fairy tales the father of the hero is very modestly the traditional wood cutter these conceptions were also alive in the cult of osiris there the divine image was carved out of a tree trunk and then placed within the hollow of the tree fraser golden bough part four in rigveda the world was also hewn out of a tree by the world sculptor the idea that the hero is his own procreator leads to the fact that he is invested with paternal attributes and reversedly the heroic attributes are given to the father in mani there exists a beautiful union of the motives he accomplishes his great labors as a religious founder hides himself for years in a cave he dies is skinned stuffed and hung up hero besides he is an artist and has a crippled foot a similar union of motives is found in veland the smith hiawatha kept silent about what he saw at the old arrow makers on his return to nokomis and he did nothing further to win minnehaha but now something happened which if it were not in an indian epic would rather be sought in the history of a neurosis hiawatha introverted his libido that is to say he fell into an extreme resistance against the real sexual demand freud he built a hut for himself in the wood in order to fast there and to experience dreams and visions for the first three days he wandered as once in his earliest youth through a forest and looked at all the animals and plants master of life he cried desponding must our lives depend on these things the question whether our lives must depend upon these things is very strange it sounds as if life were derived from these things that is to say from nature in general nature seems suddenly to have assumed a very strange significance this phenomenon can be explained only through the fact that a great amount of libido was stored up and now is given to nature as is well known men of even dull and prosy minds in the springtime of love suddenly become aware of nature and even make poems about it but we know that libido prevented from an actual way of transference always reverts to an earlier way of transference minnehaha the laughing water is so clearly an allusion to the mother that the secret yearning of the hero for the mother is powerfully touched therefore without having undertaken anything he goes home to nokomis but there again he is driven away because minnehaha already stands in his path he turns therefore even further away into that early youthful period the tones of which recall minnehaha most forcibly to his thoughts where he learnt to hear the mother sounds in the sounds of nature 
in this very strange revival of the impressions of nature we recognize a regression to those earliest and strongest nature impressions which stand next to the subsequently extinguished even stronger impressions which the child received from the mother the glamour of this feeling for her is transferred to other objects of the childish environment father's house playthings etc from which later those magic blissful feelings proceed which seem to be peculiar to the earliest childish memories when therefore hiawatha hides himself in the lap of nature it is really the mother's womb and it is to be expected that he will emerge again new-born in some form before turning to this new creation arising from introversion there is still a further significance of the preceding question to be considered whether life is dependent upon these things life may depend upon these things in the degree that they serve for nourishment we must infer in this case that suddenly the question of nutrition came very near the hero's heart this possibility will be thoroughly proven in what follows the question of nutrition indeed enters seriously into consideration first because regression to the mother necessarily revives that special path of transference namely that of nutrition through the mother as soon as the libido regresses to the pre-sexual stage there we may expect to see the function of nutrition and its symbols put in place of the sexual function thence is derived an essential root of the displacement from below upwards freud because in the pre-sexual stage the principal value belongs not to the genitals but to the mouth secondly because the hero fasted his hunger becomes predominant fasting as is well known is employed to silence sexuality also it expresses symbolically the resistance against sexuality translated into the language of the pre-sexual stage on the fourth day of his fast the hero ceased to address himself to nature he lay exhausted with half-closed eyes upon his couch sunk deep in dreams and the picture of extreme introversion we have already seen that in such circumstances an infantile internal equivalent for reality appears in the place of external life and reality this is also the case with hiawatha and he saw a youth approaching dressed in garments green and yellow coming through the purple twilight through the splendour of the sunset plumes of green bent o'er his forehead and his hair was soft and golden this remarkable apparition reveals himself in the following manner to hiawatha from the master of life descending i the friend of man mondamin come to warn you and instruct you how by struggle and by labour you shall gain what you have prayed for rise up from your bed of branches rise o youth and wrestle with me mondamin is the maize a god who is eaten arising from hiawatha's introversion his hunger taken in a double sense his longing for the nourishing mother gives birth from his soul to another hero the edible maize the son of the earth mother therefore he again arises at sunset symbolizing the entrance into the mother and in the western sunset glow he begins again the mystic struggle with the self-created god the god who has originated entirely from the longing for the nourishing mother the struggle is again the struggle for liberation from this destructive and yet productive longing mondamin is therefore equivalent to the mother and the struggle with him means the overpowering and impregnation of the mother this interpretation is entirely proven by a myth of the cherokees 
who invoke it the maze under the name of the old woman in allusion to a myth that it sprang from the blood of an old woman killed by her disobedient sons faint with famine hiawatha started from his bed of branches from the twilight of his wigwam forth into the flush of sunset came and wrestled with mondamin at his touch he felt new courage throbbing in his brain and bosom felt new life and hope and vigour run through every nerve and fibre the battle at sunset with the god of the maze gives hiawatha new strength and thus it must be because the fight for the individual depths against the paralyzing longing for the mother gives creative strength to men here indeed is the source of all creation but it demands heroic courage to fight against these forces and to wrest from them the treasure difficult to attain he who succeeds in this has in truth attained the best hiawatha wrestles with himself for his creation the struggle lasts again the charmed three days the fourth day just as mondamin prophesied hiawatha conquers him and mondamin sinks to the ground in death as mondamin previously desired hiawatha digs his grave in mother earth and soon afterwards from this grave the young and fresh maize grows for the nourishment of mankind concerning the thought of this fragment we have therein a beautiful parallel to the mystery of mithra where first the battle of the hero with his bull occurs afterwards mithra carries in transitus the bull into the cave where he kills him from this death all fertility grows all that is edible the cave corresponds to the grave the same idea is represented in the christian mysteries although generally in more beautiful human forms the soul struggle of christ in gethsemane where he struggles with himself in order to complete his work then the transitus the carrying of the cross where he takes upon himself the symbol of the destructive mother and therewith takes himself to the sacrificial grave from which after three days he triumphantly arises all these ideas express the same fundamental thoughts also the symbol of eating is not lacking in the christian mystery christ is a god who is eaten in the lord's supper his death transforms him into bread and wine which we partake of in grateful memory of his great deed the relation of agni to the soma drink and that of dionysus to wine must not be omitted here as evident parallel is samson's rending of the lion and the subsequent inhabitation of the dead lion by honey-bees which gives rise to the well-known german riddle in german food went from the glutton and sweet from the strong in the eleusinian mysteries these thoughts seem to have played a role besides demeter and persephone iacchus is chief god of the eleusinian cult he was the pure eternus the eternal boy of whom ovid says the following in latin thou boy eternal thou most beautiful one seen in the heavens without horns standing with thy virgin head etc in the great eleusinian festival procession the image of iacos was carried it is not easy to say which god is iacos possibly a boy or a new-born son similar to the etrurian tagus who bears the surname the freshly ploughed boy because according to the myth he arose from the furrow of the field behind the peasant who was ploughing this idea shows unmistakably the mondamin motive the plough is of well-known phallic meaning the furrow of the field is personified by the hindus as woman the psychology of this idea is that of a coitus referred back to the pre-sexual stage stage of nutrition the sun is the edible fruit of the field iacos passes in part as son of demeter or of persephone also appropriately as consort of demeter hero as procreator of himself he is also called in greek 
equals libido also mother libido he was identified with dionysus especially with the thracian dionysus zagreus of whom a typical fate of rebirth was related hera had goaded the titans against Ligrius, who assuming many forms sought to escape them until they finally took him when he had taken on the form of a bull in this form he was killed mithra sacrificed and dismembered and the pieces were thrown into a cauldron but zeus killed the titans by lightning and swallowed the still throbbing heart of zagreus through this act he gave him existence once more and zagreus as iacos again came forth iacos carries the torch the phallic symbol of procreation as plato testifies in the festival procession the sheaf of corn the cradle of iacos was carried in latin mystica juanus iaci the orphic legend relates that iacos was brought up by persephone when after three years slumber in the in greek a winnowing fan used as cradle he awoke this statement distinctly suggests the madaman motive the twentieth of boedromion the month boedromion lasts from about the fifth of september to the fifth of october he is called iacos in honour of the hero on the evening of this day the great torchlight procession took place on the seashore in which the quest and lament of demeter was represented the role of demeter who seeking her daughter wanders over the whole earth without food or drink has been taken over by hiawatha in the indian epic he turns to all created things without obtaining an answer as demeter first learns of her daughter from the subterranean hecate so does hiawatha first find the one sought for mondamin in the deepest introversion descent to the mother hiawatha produces from himself mondamin as a mother produces the son the longing for the mother also includes the producing mother first devouring then birth-giving concerning the real contents of the mysteries we learn through the testimony of bishop asterius about three ninety a d the following is not there in eleusis the gloomiest descent and the most solemn communion of the hierophant and the priestess between him and her alone are the torches not extinguished and does not the vast multitude regard as their salvation that which takes place between the two in the darkness that points undoubtedly to a ritual marriage which was celebrated subterraneously in mother earth the priestess of demeter seems to be the representative of the earth goddess perhaps the furrow of the field the descent into the earth is also the symbol of the mother's womb and was a widespread conception under the form of cave worship plutarch relates of the magi that they sacrificed to ahriman in greek in a sunless place lucian lets the magician mithrobarzanes in greek descent into a sunless desert place descend into the bowels of the earth according to the testimony of moses of the koran the sister fire and the brother spring were worshipped in armenia in a cave julian gave an account from the Attis legend of a in greek descent into a cave from whence cybele brings up her son lover that is to say gives birth to him the cave of christ's birth in bethlehem house of bread is said to have been an adus spilium a further eleusinian symbolism is found in the festival of hierogamus in the form of the mystic chests which according to the testimony of clemens of alexandria may have contained pastry salt and fruits the synthema confession of the mystic transmitted by clemens is suggestive in still other directions i have fasted i have drunk of the barley drink i have taken from the chest and after i have laboured i have placed it back in the basket and from the basket into the chest the question as to what lay in the chest is explained in detail by dietrich the labour he considers a phallic activity which the mystic has to perform 
in fact representations of the mystic basket are given wherein lies a phallus surrounded by fruits upon the so-called lavatelli tomb vase the sculptures of which are understood to be eleusinian ceremonies it is shown how a mystic caressed the serpent entwining demeter the caressing of the fear animal indicates a religious conquering of incest according to the testimony of clements of alexandria a serpent was in the chest the serpent in this connection is naturally of phallic nature the phallus which is forbidden in relation to the mother rhoda mentions that in the arhatophores pastry in the form of phalli and serpents were thrown into the cave near the thesmophorion this custom was a petition for the bestowal of children and harvest the snake also plays a large part in initiations under the remarkable title in greek he who achieved divinity through the womb clemens observes that the symbol of the sabazios mysteries is in greek he who achieved divinity through the womb he is a serpent and he was drawn through the womb of those who were being initiated through arnobius we learn in latin the golden serpent is crowded into the breast of the initiates and is then drawn out through the lowest parts in the orphic hymn fifty two bacchus is invoked by o fetus he who is in the vagina or womb which indicates that the god enters into man as if through the female genitals according to the testimony of hippolytus the hierophant in the mystery exclaimed the revered one has brought forth a holy boy brimos from brimo this christmas gospel unto us a son is born is illustrated especially through the tradition that the athenians secretly show to the partakers in the epoptia the great and wonderful and most perfect epoptic mystery a mown stalk of wheat the parallel for the motive of death and resurrection is the motive of losing and finding the motive appears in religious rites in exactly the same connection namely in spring festivities similar to the hieros gamos where the image of the god was hidden and found again it is an uncanonical tradition that moses left his father's house when twelve years old to teach mankind in a similar manner christ is lost by his parents and they find him again as a teacher of wisdom just as in the mohammedan legend moses and joshua lose the fish and in his place chidher the teacher of wisdom appears like the boy jesus in the temple so does the corn god lost and believed to be dead suddenly arise again from his mother into renewed youth that christ was laid in the manger is suggestive of fodder robertson therefore places the manger as parallel to the lycnon we understand from these accounts why the eleusinian mysteries were for the mystics so rich in comfort for the hope of a better world a beautiful eleusinian epitaph shows this truly a beautiful secret is proclaimed by the blessed gods mortality is not a curse but death a blessing the hymn to demeter in the mysteries also says the same blessed is he the earth-born man who hath seen this who hath not shared in these divine ceremonies he hath an unequal fate in the obscure darkness of death immortality is inherent in the eleusinian symbol in a church song of the nineteenth century by samuel price work we discover it again the world is yours lord jesus the world on which we stand because it is thy world it cannot perish only the wheat before it comes up to the light in its fertility must die in the bosom of the earth first freed from its own nature thou goest o lord our chief to heaven through thy sorrows and guide him who believes in thee on the same path then take us all equally to share in thy sorrows and kingdoms guide us through thy gate of death bring thy world into the light firmicus relates concerning the Addis mysteries in latin on a certain night an image is placed lying down in a litter there is weeping and lamentations among the people with beatings of bodies and 
tears after a time when they have become exhausted from the lamentations a light appears then the priest anoints the throats of all those who were weeping and softly whispers take courage o initiates of the redeemed divinity you shall achieve salvation through your grief such parallels show how little human personality and how much divine that is to say universally human is found in the christ's mystery no man is or indeed ever was a hero for the hero is a god and therefore impersonal and generally applicable to all christ is a spirit as is shown in the very early christian interpretation in different places of the earth and in the most varied forms and in the colouring of various periods the saviour hero appears as a fruit of the entrance of the libido into the personal maternal depths the bacchian consecrations represented upon the farnese relief contain a scene where a mystic wrapped in a mantle drawn over his head was led to silent who holds the tylenon chalice covered with the cloth the covering of the head signifies death the mystic dies figuratively like the seed corn grows again and comes to the corn harvest proclus relates that the mystics were buried up to their necks the christian church is a place of religious ceremony is really nothing but the grave of a hero catacombs the believer descends into the grave in order to rise from the dead with the hero that the meaning underlying the church is that of the mother's womb can scarcely be doubted the symbols of mass are so distinct that the mythology of the sacred act peeps out everywhere it is the magic charm of rebirth the veneration of the holy sepulchre is most plain in this respect a striking example is the holy sepulchre of st stefano in bologna the church itself a very old polygonal building consists of the remains of a temple to isis the interior contains an artificial spell lyrum a so-called holy sepulchre into which one creeps through a very little door after a long sojourn the believer reappears reborn from this mother's womb an etruscan osuarium in the archaeological museum in florence is at the same time a statue of matuta the goddess of death the clay figure of the goddess is hollowed within as a receptacle for the ashes the representation indicate that matuta is the mother her chair is adorned with sphinxes as a fitting symbol for the mother of death only a few of the further deeds of hiawatha can interest us here among these is the battle with mishnama the fish king in the eighth song this deserves to be mentioned as a typical battle of the sun hero mishnama is a fish monster who dwells at the bottom of the waters challenged by hiawatha to battle he devours the hero together with his boat in his wrath he darted upward flashing leaped into the sunshine opened his great jaws and swallowed both canoe and hiawatha down into that darksome cavern plunged the headlong hiawatha as a log on some black river shoots and plunges down the rapids found himself in utter darkness groped about in helpless wonder till he felt a great heart beating throbbing in that utter darkness and he smote it in his anger with his fist the heart of nama felt a mighty king of fishes shudder through each nerve and fibre crosswise then did hiawatha drag his birth canoe for safety lest from out the jaws of nama in the turmoil and confusion forth he might be hurled and perish it is the typical myth of the work of the hero distributed over the entire world he takes to a boat fights with the sea monsters devoured he defends himself against being bitten or crushed resistance or stamping motive having arrived in the interior of the whale dragon he seeks the vital organ cuts off or in some way destroys often the death of the monster occurs as a result of a fire which the hero secretly makes within him he mysteriously creates in the womb of death life the rising sun thus dies the fish which drifts ashore where with the assistance of birds the hero again attains the light of day the bird in this sense probably means the reascent of the sun the longing of the libido the rebirth of the phoenix the longing is very frequently represented by the symbol of hovering the sun symbol of the bird rising from the water is etymologically contained in the singing swan swan is derived from the root sven like sun and tone 
see the preceding this act signifies rebirth and the bringing forth of life from the mother and by this means the ultimate destruction of death which according to a negro myth has come into the world through the mistake of an old woman who at the time of the general casting of skins for men renewed their youth through casting their skin like snakes drew on through absent-mindedness her old skin instead of a new one and as a result died but the effect of such an act could not be of any duration again and again troubles of the hero are renewed always under the symbol of deliverance from the mother just as hera as the pursuing mother is the real source of the great deeds of hercules so does nokomis allow hiawatha no rest and raises up new difficulties in his path in form of desperate adventures in which the hero may perhaps conquer but also perhaps may perish the libido of mankind is always in advance of his consciousness unless his libido calls him forth to new dangers he sinks into slothful inactivity or on the other hand childish longing for the mother overcomes him at the summit of his existence and he allows himself to become pitifully weak instead of striving with desperate courage towards the highest the mother becomes the demon who summons the hero to adventure and who also places in his path the poisonous serpent which will strike him thus nokomis in the ninth song calls hiawatha points with her hand to the west where the sun sets in purple splendor and says to him yonder dwells the great pearl feather megasoguan the magician manito of wealth and wampum guarded by his fiery serpents guarded by the black pitch water you can see his fiery serpents the kenabik the great serpents coiling playing in the water this danger lurking in the west is known to mean death which no one even the mightiest escapes this magician as we learn also killed the father of nokomis now she sends her son forth to avenge the father horus through the symbols attributed to the magician it may easily be recognized what he symbolizes snake and water belong to the mother the snake as a symbol of the repressed longing for the mother or in other words as a symbol of resistance encircles protectingly and defensively the maternal rock inhabits the cave winds itself upwards around the mother tree and guards the precious hoard the mysterious treasure the black stygian water is like the black muddy spring of dal car nine the place where the sun dies and enters into rebirth the maternal sea of death and night on his journey thither hiawatha takes with him the magic oil of misha nama which helps his boat through the waters of death also a sort of charm for immortality like the dragon's blood for siegfried etc first hiawatha slays the great serpent of the night journey in the sea over the stygian waters it is written all night long he sailed upon it sailed upon that sluggish water covered with its mould of ages black with rotting water rushes rank with flags and leaves of lilies stagnant lifeless dreary dismal lighted by the shimmering moonlight and by will of the wisp illumined fires by ghosts of dead men kindled in their weary night encampments the description plainly shows the character of a water of death the contents of the water point to an already mentioned motive that of encoiling and devouring it is said in the key to dreams of yagadeva whoever in dreams surrounds his body with baste creepers or ropes with snake skins threads or tissues dies i refer to the preceding arguments in regard to this having come into the west land the hero challenges the magician to battle a terrible struggle begins hiawatha is powerless because megasagwan is invulnerable at evening hiawatha retires wounded despairing for a while in order to rest pause to rest beneath the pine tree from whose branches trailed the mosses and whose trunk was coated over with the dead man's moccasin leather with the fungus white and yellow this protecting tree is described as coated over with the moccasin leather of the dead the fungus this investing of the tree with anthropomorphic attributes is also an important rite wherever tree worship prevails as for example in india where each village has its sacred tree which is clothed and in general treated as a human being the trees are anointed with fragrant water sprinkled with powder adorned with garlands and draperies just as among men the piercing of the ears was performed as an apotrophic 
charm against death so does it occur with the holy tree of all the trees of india there is none more sacred to the hindus than the aswatha ficus religiosa it is known to them as Ariska, raja king of trees brahma vishnu and mahasvar live in it and the worship of it is the worship of the triad almost every indian village has an aswatha etc this village linden tree well known to us is here clearly characterized as the mother symbol it contains the three gods hence when hiawatha retires to rest under the pine tree it is a dangerous step because he resigns himself to the mother whose garment is the garment of death the devouring mother as in the whale dragon the hero also in this situation needs a helpful bird that is to say the helpful animals which represent the benevolent parents suddenly from the boughs above him sang the mama the woodpecker aim your arrows hiawatha at the head of megasugwan strike the tuft of hair upon it at their roots the long black tresses there alone can he be wounded now amusing to relate mama hurried to his help it is a peculiar fact that the woodpecker was also the mama of romulus and remus who put nourishment into the mouths of the twins with his beak compare with that the role of the vulture in leonardo's dream the vulture is sacred to mars like the woodpecker with the maternal significance of the woodpecker the ancient italian folk superstition agrees that from the tree upon which this bird nested any nail which has been driven in will soon drop out again the woodpecker owes its special significance to the circumstance that he hammers holes into trees to drive nails in as above it is therefore understandable that he was made much of in the roman legend as an old king of the country a possessor or ruler of the holy tree the primitive image of the pater familius an old fable relates how circe the spouse of king picus transformed him into the picus martius the woodpecker the sorceress is the new creating mother who has magic influence upon the son husband she kills him transforms him into the soul bird the unfulfilled wish picus was also understood as the wood demon and incubus as well as the soothsayer all of which fully indicate the mother libido picus was often placed on a par with pecumnus by the ancients pecumnus is the inseparable companion of pilumnus and both are actually called infantium dei the gods of little children especially it was said of pilumnus that he defended newborn children against the destroying attacks of the wood demon salvanus good and bad mother the motive of the two mothers the benevolent bird a wish thought of deliverance which arises from introversion advises the hero to shoot the magician under the hair which is the only vulnerable spot this spot is the phallic point if one may venture to say so it is at the top of the head at the place where the mystic birth from the head takes place which even to-day appears in children's sexual theories into that hiawatha shoots one may say very naturally three arrows the well-known phallic symbol and thus kills Nagasakwan. thereupon he steals the magic wampum armor which renders him invulnerable means of immortality he significantly leaves the dead lying in the water because the magician is the fearful mother on the shore he left the body half on land and half in water in the sand his feet were buried and his face was in the water thus the situation is the same as with the fish king because the monster is the personification of the water of death which in its turn represents the devouring mother this great deed of hiawatha's where he has vanquished the mother as the death-bringing demon is followed by his marriage with minnehaha a little fable which the poet has inserted in the later song is noteworthy an old man is transformed into a youth by crawling through a hollow oak tree in the fourteenth song is a description of how hiawatha discovers writing i limit myself to the description of two hieroglyphic tokens gitji manito the mighty he the master of life was painted as an egg with points projecting to the four winds of the heavens everywhere is the great spirit was the meaning of this symbol the world lies in the egg which encompasses it at every point it is the cosmic woman with child the symbol of which plato as well as the vedas has made use of this mother is like the air 
which is everywhere but air is spirit the mother of the world is a spirit michi manito the mighty he the dreadful spirit of evil as a serpent was depicted as kenabi the great serpent but the spirit of evil is fear is the forbidden desire the adversary who opposes not only each individual heroic deed but life in its struggle for eternal duration as well and who introduces into our body the poison of weakness and age through the treacherous bite of the serpent it is all that is retrogressive and as the model of our first world is our mother all retrogressive tendencies are towards the mother and therefore are disguised under the incest image in both these ideas the poet has represented in mythologic symbols the libido arising from the mother and the libido striving backward towards the mother there is a description in the fifteenth song how chibiabos hiawatha's best friend the amiable player and singer the embodiment of the joy of life was enticed by the evil spirits into ambush fell through the ice and was drowned hiawatha mourns for him so long that he succeeds with the aid of the magician in calling him back again but the revivified friend is only a spirit and he becomes master of the land of spirits osiris lord of the underworld the two dioscuri battles again follow and then comes the loss of a second friend kawa sin the embodiment of physical strength in the twentieth song occur famine and the death of minnehaha foretold by two taciturn guests from the land of death and in the twenty-second song hiawatha prepares for a final journey to the west land i am going o nokomis on a long and distant journey to the portals of the sunset to the regions of the home wind of the northwest wind ki waden one long track and trail of splendor down whose stream as down a river westward westward hiawatha sailed into the fiery sunset sailed into the purple vapors sailed into the dusk of evening thus departed hiawatha hiawatha the beloved in the glory of the sunset in the purple mist of evening to the regions of the home wind of the northwest wind kiwaden to the islands of the blessed to the kingdom of ponema to the land of the hereafter the sun victoriously arising tears itself away from the embrace and clasp from the enveloping womb of the sea and sinks again into the maternal sea into night the all-enveloping and the all-reproducing leaving behind in the heights of midday and all its glorious works this image was the first and was profoundly entitled to become the symbolic carrier of human destiny in the morning of life man painfully tears himself loose from the mother from the domestic hearth to rise through battle to his heights not seeing his worst enemy in front of him but bearing him within himself as a deadly longing for the depths within for drowning in his own source for becoming absorbed into the mother his life is a constant struggle with death a violent and transitory delivery from the always lurking night this death is no external enemy but a deep personal longing for quiet and for the profound peace of non-existence for a dreamless sleep in the ebb and flow of the sea of life even in his highest endeavour for harmony and equilibrium for philosophic depths and artistic enthusiasm he seeks death immobility satiety and rest if like pyrotheus he tarries too long in this place of rest and peace he is overcome by torpidity and the poison of the serpent paralyzes him for all time if he is to live he must fight and sacrifice his longing for the past in order to rise to his own heights and having reached the noonday heights he must also sacrifice the love for his own achievements for he may not loiter the sun also sacrifices its greatest strength in order to hasten onwards to the fruits of autumn which are the seeds of immortality fulfilled in children in works in posthumous fame in a new order of things all of which in their turn begin and complete the sun's course over again the song of hiawatha contains as these extracts show a material which is very well adapted to bring into play the abundance of ancient symbolic possibilities latent in the human mind and to stimulate it to the creation of mythologic figures but the products always contain the same old problems of humanity which rise again and again in new symbolic disguise from the shadowy world of the unconscious thus miss miller is reminded through the longing of chewantable of another mythic cycle which appeared in the form of wagner's siegfried especially is this shown in the passage in chewantable's monologue where he exclaims there is not one who understands me not one who resembles me 
not one who has a soul sister to mine miss miller observes that the sentiment of this passage has the greatest analogy with the feelings which siegfried experienced for brunhilde this analogy causes us to cast a glance at the song of siegfried especially at the relation of siegfried and brunhilde this analogy causes us to cast a glance at the song of siegfried especially at the relation of siegfried and brunhilde it is a well-recognized fact that brunhilde the valkyr gives protection to the birth incestuous of siegfried but while sieglinde is the human mother brunhilde has the role of spiritual mother mother imago however unlike hera towards hercules she is not a pursuer but benevolent this sin in which she is an accomplice by means of the help she renders is the reason for her banishment by wotan the strange birth of siegfried from the sister-wife distinguishes him as horus as the reborn son a reincarnation of the retreating osiris wotan the birth of the young son of the hero results indeed from mankind who however are merely the human bearers of the cosmic symbolism thus the birth is protected by the spirit mother hera lilith she sends sieglinde with the child in her womb mary's flight on the night journey on the sea to the east onward hasten turn to the east o woman thou cherishest the sublimest hero of the world in thy sheltering womb the motive of dismemberment is found again in the broken sword of siegmund which was kept for siegfried from the dismemberment life is pieced together again the medea wonder just as a smith forges the pieces together so is the dismembered dead again put together this comparison is also found in Tomius of plato the parts of the world joined together with pegs in the rig veda ten seventy two the creator of the world brahmanaspati is a smith brahmanaspati as a blacksmith welded the world together the sword has the significance of the phallic sun power therefore a sword proceeds from the mouth of the apocalyptic christ that is to say the procreative fire the word or the procreative logos in rig veda brahmanaspati is also a prayer word which possessed an ancient creative significance and this prayer of the singers expanding from itself became a cow which was already there before the world dwelling together in the womb of this god foster children of the same keeper are the gods rig veda ten thirty one the logos became a cow that is to say the mother who is pregnant with the gods in christian uncanonical fantasies where the holy ghost has feminine significance we have the well-known motive of the two mothers the earthly mother mary and the spiritual mother the holy ghost the transformation of the logos into the mother is not remarkable in itself because the origin of the phenomenon fire speech seems to be the mother libido according to the discussion in the earlier chapter the spiritual is the mother libido the significance of the sword in the sanskrit conception tejas is probably partly determined by its sharpness as is shown above in its connection with the libido conception the motive of pursuit the pursuing sieglinde analogous to leto is not here bound up with the spiritual mother but with wotan therefore corresponding to the linos legend where the father of the wife is also the pursuer wotan is also the father of brunhilde brunhilde stands in a peculiar 
relation to wotan brunhilde says to wotan thou speakest to the will of wotan by telling me what thou wishest who am i were i not thy will wotan i take counsel only with myself when i speak with thee brunhilde is also somewhat the angel of the face that creative will or word emanating from god also the logos which became the child-bearing woman god created the world through his word that is to say his mother the woman who is to bring him forth again he lays his own egg this peculiar conception it seems to me can be explained by assuming that the libido overflowing into speech thought has preserved its sexual character to an extraordinary degree as a result of the inherent inertia in this way the word had to execute and fulfil all that was denied to the sexual wish namely the return into the mother in order to attain eternal duration the word fulfils this wish by itself becoming the daughter the wife the mother of the god who brings him forth anew wagner has this idea vaguely in his mind in wotan's lament over brunhilde none as she knew my inmost thought none knew the source of my will as she she herself was the creating womb of my wish and so now she has broken the blessed union brunhilde's sin is the favouring of siegmund but behind this lies incest this is projected into the brother-sister relation of siegmund and sieglinda in reality and archaically expressed wotan the father has entered into his self-created daughter in order to rejuvenate himself but this fact must of course be veiled wotan is rightly indignant with brunhilde for she has taken the isis role and through the birth of the son has deprived the old man of his power the first attack of the death serpent in the form of the son siegmund wotan has repelled he has broken siegmund's sword but siegmund rises again in a grandson this inevitable fate is always helped by the woman hence the wrath of wotan at siegfried's birth sieglinda dies as is proper the foster mother is apparently not a woman but a chthonic god a crippled dwarf who belongs to that tribe which renounces love the egyptian god of the underworld the crippled shadow of osiris who celebrated a melancholy resurrection in the sexless semi-ape harpocrates is the tutor of horus who has to avenge the death of his father meanwhile brunhilde sleeps the enchanted sleep like a hieroscamos upon a mountain where wotan has put her to sleep with the magic thorn etta surrounded by the flames of wotan's fire equal to libido which wards off every one but mime becomes siegfried's enemy and wills his death through fafner here mime's dynamic nature is revealed he is a masculine representation of the terrible mother also a foster mother of demoniac nature who places the poisonous worm typhon in her son's horus's path siegfried's longing for the mother drives him away from mime and his travels begin with the mother of death and lead through vanquishing the terrible mother to the woman siegfried off with the imp i ne'er would see him more might i but know what my mother was like that will my thought never tell me her eyes tender light surely did shine like the soft eyes of the doe siegfried decides to separate from the demon which was the mother in the past and he gropes forward with the longing directed towards the mother nature acquires a hidden maternal significance for him doe in the tones of nature he discovers a suggestion of the maternal voice and the maternal language siegfried thou gracious birdling 
strange art thou to me dost thou in the wood here dwell ah would that i could take thy meaning thy song something would say perchance of my loving mother this psychology we have already encountered in hiawatha by means of his dialogue with the bird bird like wind and arrow represents the wish the winged longing siegfried entices fafner from the cave his desires turn back to the mother and the chthonic demon the cave-dwelling terror of the woods appears fafner is the protector of the treasure in his cave lies the hoard the source of life and power the mother possesses the libido of the son and jealously does she guard it translated into psychological language this means the positive transference succeeds only through the release of the libido from the mother imago the incestuous object in general only in this manner is it possible to gain one's libido the incomparable treasure and this requires a mighty struggle the whole battle of adaptation the siegfried legend has abundantly described the outcome of this battle with fafner according to the edda siegfried eats fafner's heart the seed of life he wins the magic cap through whose power all beric had changed himself into a serpent this refers to the motive of casting the skin rejuvenation by means of the magic cap one can vanish and assume different shapes the vanishing probably refers to dying and to the invisible presence that is existence in the mother's womb a luck bringing cap amniotic covering the new-born child occasionally wears over his head the call moreover siegfried drinks the dragon's blood which makes it possible for him to understand the language of birds and consequently he enters into a peculiar relation with nature a dominating position the result of his knowledge and finally wins the treasure hort is a mediaeval and old high german word with the meaning of collected and guarded treasure gothic hasd old scandinavian hod germanic hasda from pre-germanic husdho for kudfo the concealed klug as to this the greek netho and netho equals to hide to conceal also hut hut to guard english hide germanic root hud from indo-germanic kuth questionable to greek netho and nathos cavity feminine genitals prelwitz too traces gothic hudsd anglo-saxon hide english hide and hoard to greek netho whitley stokes traces english hide anglo-saxon hyden new high german hutta latin kudo equals helmet sanskrit kuhara cave to primitive celtic kudo equals concealment latin occultatio the assumption of klug is also supported in other directions namely from the point of view of the primitive idea there exists in athens a sacred place a Taminos of g with a surname olympia here the ground is torn open for about a yard in width and they say after the flood at the time of deucalion that the water receded here and every year they throw into the fissure wheat meal kneaded with honey we have observed previously that among the araphorian pastry in the form of snakes and phalli was thrown into a crevice in the earth this was mentioned in connection with the ceremonies of fertilizing the earth we have touched slightly already upon the sacrifice in the earth crevice among the vatschandis the flood of death has passed characteristically into the crevice of the earth that is back into the mother again because from the mother the universal great death has come in the first place the flood is simply the counterpart of the vivifying and all-producing water in greek ocean who arose to be the producer of all one sacrifices the honey-cake 
to the mother so that she may spare one from death thus every year in rome a gold sacrifice was thrown into the lacus courteous into the former fissure in the earth which could only be closed through the sacrificial death of courteous he was the typical hero who has journeyed into the underworld in order to conquer the danger threatening the roman state from the opening of the abyss caeneus amphiaros in the amphiarion of oropos those healed through the temple incubation threw their gifts of gold into the sacred well of which pausanias says if any one is healed of a sickness through a saying of the oracle then it is customary to throw a silver or gold coin into the well because here amphiaros has ascended as a god it is probable that this oropic well is also the place of his katabasis descent into the lower world there were many entrances into hades in antiquity thus near eleusis there was an abyss through which iodineus passed up and down when he kidnapped cora dragon and maiden the libido overcome by resistance life replaced by death there were crevices in the rocks through which souls could ascend to the upper world behind the temple of Cathonia in her myony lay a sacred district of pluto with a ravine through which hercules had brought up cerberus in addition there was an acherusian lake this ravine was therefore the entrance to the place where death was conquered the lake also belongs here as a further mother symbol for symbols appear massed together as they are surrogates and therefore do not afford the same satisfaction of desire as accorded by reality so that the unsatisfied remnant of the libido must seek still further symbolic outlets the ravine in the areopagus in athens was considered the seat of inhabitants of the lower world an old grecian custom suggests a similar idea girls were sent into a cavern where a poisonous snake dwelt as a test of virginity if they were bitten by the snake it was a token that they were no longer chaste we find this same motive again in the roman legend of st sylvester at the end of the fifth century in latin there was a huge dragon on mount tarpeus where the capitolium stands once a month with sacrilegious maidens the priest descended three hundred and sixty-five steps into the hell of this dragon carrying the expiatory offerings of food for the dragon then the dragon suddenly and unexpectedly arose and though he did not come out he poisoned the air with his breath thence came the mortality of man and the deeper sorrow for the death of the children when for the defence of truth st sylvester had had a conflict with a heathen it came to this that the heathen said sylvester go down to the dragon and in the name of thy god make him desist from the killing of mankind st peter appeared to sylvester in a dream and advised him to close his door to the underworld with chains according to the model in revelation chapter twenty one and i saw an angel come down from heaven having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand two and he laid hold on the dragon that old serpent which is the devil and satan and bound him a thousand years three and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him the anonymous author of a writing de promissionibus of the beginning of the fifth century mentions a very similar legend in latin near the city of rome there was a certain cavern in which appeared a dragon of remarkable size mechanically produced brandishing a sword in his mouth his eyes glittering like gems fearful and terrible hither came virgins every year devoted to this service adorned with flowers who were given to him in sacrifice bringing these gifts they unknowingly descended the steps to a point where with diabolical cunning the dragon was suspended striking those who came a blow with the sword so that the innocent blood was shed now there was a certain 
monk who on account of his good deeds was well known to stilicho the patrician he killed this dragon as follows he examined each separate step carefully both with a rod and his own hand until discovering the false step he exposed the diabolical fraud then jumping over this step he went down and killed the dragon cutting him to pieces demonstrating that one who could be destroyed by human hand could not be a divinity the hero battling with the dragon has much in common with the dragon and also he takes over his qualities for example invulnerability as the footnotes show the similarity is carried still further sparkling eyes sword in his mouth translated psychologically the dragon is merely the son's repressed longing striving towards the mother therefore the son is the dragon as even christ is identified with the serpent which once upon a time similia similibus had controlled the snake plague in the wilderness john three fourteen as a serpent he is to be crucified that is to say as one striving backwards towards the mother he must die hanging or suspended on the mother tree christ and the dragon of the antichrist are in the closest contact in the history of their appearance and their cosmic meaning compare bouasset the antichrist the legend of the dragon concealed in the antichrist myth belongs to the life of the hero and therefore is immortal in none of the newer forms of myth are the pairs of opposites so perceptibly near as in that of christ and antichrist i refer to the remarkable psychologic description of this problem in marischkowski's romance leonardo da vinci that the dragon is only an artifice is a useful and delightfully rationalistic conceit which is most significant for that period in this way the dismal gods were effectually vulgarized the schizophrenic insane readily make use of this mechanism in order to depreciate efficient personalities one often hears the stereotyped lament it is all a play artificial made up etc a dream of a schizophrenic is most significant he is sitting in a dark room which has only a single small window through which he can see the sky the sun and moon appear but they are only made artificially from oil paper denial of the deleterious incest influence the descent of the three hundred and sixty-five steps refers to the sun's course to the cavern of death and rebirth that this cavern actually stands in a relation to the subterranean mother of death can be shown by a note in malalas the historian of antioch who relates that diocletian consecrated there a crypt to hecate to which one descends by three hundred and sixty-five steps cave mysteries seem to have been celebrated for hecate in samothrace as well the serpent also played a great part as a regular symbolic attribute in the service of hecate the mysteries of hecate flourished in rome towards the end of the fourth century so that the two foregoing legends might indeed relate to her cult hecate is a real spectral goddess of night and phantoms a mar she is represented as riding and in hesiod occurs as the patron of riders she sends the horrible nocturnal fear phantom the impusa of whom aristophanes says that she appears enclosed in a bladder swollen with blood according to libanius the mother of ankynes is also called impusa for the reason that out of dark places she rushes on children and women impusa like hecate has peculiar feet one foot is made of brass the other of ass dung hecate has snake-like feet which as in the triple form ascribed to hecate points to her phallic libido nature in trolls hecate appears next to priapus there is also a hecate aphrodisius her symbols are the key the whip the snake the dagger and the torch as mother of death dogs accompany her the significance of which we have previously discussed at length as guardian of the door of hades and as goddess of dogs she is a threefold form and really identified with cerberus thus hercules in bringing up cerberus brings the conquered mother of death into the upper world as spirit mother moon 
she sends madness lunacy this mythical observation states that the mother sends madness by far the majority of the cases of insanity consist in fact in the domination of the individual by the material of the incest fantasy in the mysteries of cerberus a rod called in greek white-leaved was broken off this rod protected the purity of virgins and caused any one who touched the plant to become insane we recognize in this the motive of the sacred tree which as mother must not be touched an act which only an insane person would commit hecate as nightmare appears in the form of impusa in a vampire role or as lamia as devourer of men perhaps also in that more beautiful guise the bride of corinth she is the mother of all charms and witches the patron of medea because the power of the terrible mother is magical and irresistible working upward from the unconscious in greek syncretism she plays a very significant role she is confused with artemis who also has the surname in greek far shooting hecate the one striking at a distance or striking according to her will in which we recognize again her superior power artemis is the huntress with hounds and so hecate through confusion with her becomes in greek the wild nocturnal huntress god as huntsman see above she has her name in common with apollo in greek far shooting the far darting from the standpoint of the libido theory this connection is easily understandable because apollo merely symbolizes the more positive side of the same amount of libido the confusion of hecate with brimo as subterranean mother is understandable also with persephone and rhea the primitive all-mother intelligible through the maternal significance is the confusion with elithia the midwife hecate is also the direct goddess of births in greek goddess of birth the multiplier of cattle and goddess of marriage hecate orphically occupies the centre of the world as aphrodite and gaia even as the world soul in general on a carved gem she is represented carrying the cross on her head the beam on which the criminal was scourged is called in greek hecate to her as to the roman trivia the triple roads or shied veg forked road or crossways were dedicated and where roads branch off or unite sacrifices of dogs were brought her there the bodies of the executed were thrown the sacrifice occurs at the point of crossing etymologically shida sheath for example sword sheath sheath for watershed and sheath for vagina is identical with shiden to split or to separate the meaning of a sacrifice at this place would therefore be as follows to offer something to the mother at the place of junction or at the fissure compare the sacrifice to the chthonic gods in the abyss the taminos of gay the abyss and the well are easily understood as the gates of life and death past which every one gladly creeps faust and sacrifices there his obolus or his in greek sacrificial cakes offered to the gods instead of his body just as hercules soothed cerberus with the honey cakes compare with this the mythical significance of the dog thus the crevice at delphi with the spring castalia was the seat of the chthonic dragon python who was conquered by the sun hero apollo python incited by hera pursued leta pregnant with apollo but she on the floating island of delos nocturnal journey on the sea gave birth to her child who later slew the python that is to say conquered in it the spirit mother in hierapolis edessa the temple was erected above the crevice through which the flood had poured out and in jerusalem the foundation stone of the temple covered the great abyss just as christian churches are frequently built over caves grottoes wells etc 
in the mithra grotto and all the other sacred caves up to the christian catacombs which owe their significance not to the legendary persecutions but to the worship of the dead we come across the same fundamental motive the burial of the dead in a holy place in the garden of the dead in cloisters crypts etc is restitution to the mother with the certain hope of resurrection by which such burial is rightfully rewarded the animal of death which dwells in the cave had to be soothed in early times through human sacrifices later with natural gifts therefore the attic custom gives to the dead the offering to pacify the dog of hell the three-headed monster at the gate of the underworld a more recent elaboration of the natural gifts seems to be the obelisk for charon who is therefore designated by rhoda as the second cerberus corresponding to the egyptian dog-faced god anubis dog and serpent of the underworld dragon are likewise identical in the tragedies the erinyes are serpents as well as dogs the serpents tycon and echidna are parents of the serpents hydra the dragon of the hesperides and gorgo and of the dog cerberus orthrus scylla serpents and dogs are also protectors of the treasure the chthonic god was probably always a serpent dwelling in a cave and was fed with in greek ritual sacrificial food offered to the gods in the asclepiadian of the later period the sacred serpents were scarcely visible meaning that they probably existed only figuratively nothing was left but the hole in which the snake was said to dwell there the in greek ritual sacrificial food offered to the gods were placed later the obelisk was thrown in the sacred cavern in the temple of kos consisted of a rectangular pit upon which was laid a stone lid with a square hole this arrangement serves the purpose of a treasure house the snake hole had become a slit for money a sacrificial box and the cave had become a treasure that this development which herzog traces agrees excellently with the actual condition is shown by a discovery in the temple of aesculapius and hygeia in ptolemaeus an encoiled granite snake with arched neck was found in the middle of the coil is seen a narrow slit polished by usage just large enough to allow a coin of four centimetres diameter at most to fall through at the side are holes for handles to lift the heavy pieces the under half of which is used as a cover herzog gibbet page two twelve the serpent as protector of the hoard now lies on the treasure house the fear of the maternal womb of death has become the guardian of the treasure of life that the snake in this connection is really a symbol of death that is to say of the dead libido results from the fact that the souls of the dead like the chthonic gods appear as serpents as dwellers in the kingdom of the mother of death this development of symbol allows us to recognize easily the transitions of the originally very primitive significance of the crevice in the earth as mother to the meaning of treasure house and can therefore support the etymology of hort hoard treasure as suggested by clude in greek means the innermost womb of the earth hades or as Klug adds is of similar meaning cavity or womb prowitz does not mention this connection thick however compares new high german hort gothic husd to armenian kust abdomen church slavonian sista vedic kosta abdomen from the indo-germanic root kaustho equals viscera lower abdomen room storeroom prelwitz compares certain greek words equal to urinary bladder bag purse sanskrit kusthras equal cavity of the loins then other greek terms for cavity or vault little chest uh, and then i'm pregnant here from other greek words cave hole cup 
depression under the eye swelling wave billow power force lord old iranian cower cur equal hero sanskrit cure hyphen s equal strong hero the fundamental indo-germanic roots are kivod equal to swell to be strong from that the above-mentioned greek words and latin words interpreted as hollow vaulted cavity hole cavity enclosure cage scene and assembly cavity opening enclosure stall swell participle swelling pregnant pregnant sanskrit swelling strong powerful hero the treasure which the hero fetches from the dark cavern is swelling life it is himself the hero newborn from the anxiety of pregnancy and the birth throes thus the hindu firebringer is called mata rikvan meaning the one swelling in the mother the hero striving towards the mother is the dragon and when he separates from the mother he becomes the conqueror of the dragon this train of thought which we have already hinted at previously in christ and antichrist may be traced even into the details of christian fantasy there is a series of mediaeval pictures in which the communion cup contains a dragon a snake of, or some sort of small animal the cup is the receptacle the maternal womb of the god resurrected in the wine the cup is the cavern where the serpent dwells the god who sheds his skin in the state of metamorphosis for christ is also the serpent these symbolisms are used in an obscure connection in first corinthians verse ten paul writes of the jews who were all baptized into moses in the cloud and in the sea also reborn and did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was christ they drank from the mother the generative rock birth from the rock the milk of rejuvenation the meat of immortality and this rock was christ here identified with the mother because he is the symbolic representative of the mother libido when we drink from the cup then we drink from the mother's breast immortality and everlasting salvation paul wrote of the jews that they ate and then rose up to dance and to indulge in fornication and then twenty-three thousand of them were swept off by the plague of serpents the remedy for the survivors however was the sight of a serpent hanging on a pole from it was derived the cure the cup of blessing which we bless is not the communion of the blood of christ the bread which we break is it not the communion of the body of christ for we being many are one bread and one body for we are all partakers of one bread first corinthians ten sixteen seventeen bread and wine are the body and the blood of christ the food of the immortals who are brothers with christ and greek word for those who come from the same womb we who are reborn again from the mother are all heroes together with christ and enjoy immortal food as with the jews so too with the christians there is imminent danger of unworthy partaking for this mystery which is very closely related psychologically with the subterranean hieros gamos of eleusis involves a mysterious union of man in a spiritual sense which was constantly misunderstood by the profane and was retranslated into his language where mystery is equivalent to orgy and secrecy to vice a very interesting blasphemer and sectarian of the beginning of the nineteenth century named unternacherer has made the following comment on the last supper the communion of the devil is in this brothel all they sacrifice here they sacrifice to the devil and not to god there they have the devil's cup and the devil's dish there they have sucked the head of the snake there they have fed upon the iniquitous bread and drunken the wine of wickedness unter nahar is an adherent or a forerunner of the theory of living one's own nature he dreams of himself as a sort of priapic divinity he says of himself black-haired very charming and handsome in countenance and every one enjoys listening to thee on account of the amiable speeches which come from my mouth therefore the maids love thee he preaches the cult of nakedness ye fools and blind men behold god has created man in his image as male and female and has blessed them instead 
be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and make it subject to thee therefore he has given the greatest honour to these poor members and has placed them naked in the garden etc now are the fig leaves and the covering removed because thou hast turned to the lord for the lord is the spirit and where the spirit of the lord is there is freedom there the clearness of the lord is mirrored with uncovered countenance this is precious before god and this is the glory of the lord and the adornment of our god when you stand in the image and honour of your god as god created you naked and not ashamed who can ever praise sufficiently in the sons and daughters of the living god those parts of the body which are destined to procreate in the lap of the daughters of jerusalem is the gate of the lord and the just will go into the temple there to the altar and in the lap of the sons of the living god is the water-pipe of the upper part which is a tube like a rod to measure the temple and altar and under the water tube the sacred stones are placed as a sign and testimony of the lord who has taken to himself the seed of abraham out of the seeds in the chamber of the mother god creates a man with his hands as an image of himself then the mother house and the mother chamber is opened in the daughters of the living god and god himself brings forth a child through them thus god creates children from the stones for the seed comes from the stones history teaches in manifold examples how the religious mysteries are liable to change suddenly into sexual orgies because they have originated from an overvaluation of the orgy it is characteristic that this priapic divinity returns again to the old symbol of the snake which in the mystery enters into the faithful fertilizing and spiritualizing them although it originally possessed a phallic significance in the mysteries of the ophites the festival was really celebrated with serpents in which the animals were even kissed compare the caressing of the snake of demeter in the eleusinian mysteries in the sexual orgies of the modern christian sects the phallic kiss plays a very important role unter was an uncultivated crazy peasant and it is unlikely that the orphitic religious ceremonies were known to him the phallic significance is expressed negatively or mysteriously through the serpent which always points to a secret related thought this related thought connects with the mother thus in a dream a patient found the following imagery a serpent shot out from a moist cave and bit the dreamer in the region of the genitals this dream took place at the instant when the patient was convinced of the truth of the analysis and began to free himself from the bond of his mother complex the meaning is i am convinced that i am inspired and poisoned by the mother the contrary manner of expression is characteristic of the dream at the moment when he felt the impulse to go forwards he perceived the attachment to the mother another patient had the following dream during a relapse in which the libido was again wholly introverted for a time she was entirely filled within by a great snake only one end of the tail peeped out from her arm she wanted to seize it but it escaped her a patient with a very strong introversion catatonic state complained to me that a snake was stuck in her throat this symbolism is also used by nietzsche in the vision of the shepherd and the snake and verily what i saw was like nothing i ever saw before i saw a young shepherd writhing choking twitching with a convulsed face from whose mouth hung a black heavy serpent did i ever see so much disgust and pallid fear upon a countenance might he have been sleeping and the snake crept into his mouth there it bit him fast my hand tore at the serpent and tore in vain i failed to tear the serpent out of his mouth then there cried out of me bite bite its head off bite i exclaimed all my horror my hate my disgust my compassion all the good and bad cried out from me 
in one voice ye intrepid ones around me solve for me the riddle which i saw make clear to me the vision of the lonesomest one for it was a vision and a prophecy what did then i behold in parable and who is it who is still to come who is the shepherd into whose mouth crept the snake who is the man into whose throat all the heaviness and the blackest would creep but the shepherd bit as my cry had told him he bit with a huge bite far away did he spit the head of the serpent and sprang up no longer shepherd no longer man a transfigured being an illuminated being who laughed never yet on earth did a man laugh as he laughed o oh, my brethren i heard a laugh which was no human laughter and now a thirst consumeth me a longing that is never allayed my longing for this laugh eats into me oh how can i suffer still to live and how now can i bear to die the snake represents the introverting libido through introversion one is fertilized inspired regenerated and reborn from the god in hindu philosophy this idea of creative intellectual activity has even cosmogenic significance the unknown original creator of all things is according to rigveda ten one twenty one prajapati the lord of creation in the various brahmas his cosmogenic activity was depicted in the following manner prajapati desired i will procreate myself i will be manifold he performed tapas after he had performed tapas he created these worlds the strange conception of tapas is to be translated according to dusan as he heated himself with his own heat with the sense of he brooded he hatched here the hatcher and the hatched are not two but one and the same identical being as hiranyagava prajapati is the egg produced from himself the world egg from which he hatches himself he creeps into himself he becomes his own uterus becomes pregnant with himself in order to give birth to the world of multiplicity thus prajapati through the way of introversion changed into something new the multiplicity of the world it is of especial interest to note how the most remote things come into contact dusen observes in the degree that the conception of tapas heat becomes in hot india the symbol of exertion and distress the tapo atabayata began to assume the meaning of self-castigation and became related to the idea that creation is an act of self-renunciation on the part of the creator self-incubation and self-castigation and introversion are very closely connected ideas the zosimos vision mentioned above betrays the same train of thought where it is said of the place of transformation that it is in greek the place of discipline we have already observed that the place of transformation is really the uterus absorption in one's self introversion is an entrance into one's own uterus and also at the same time asceticism in the philosophy of the brahmans the world arose from this activity among the post-christian gnostics it produced the revival and spiritual rebirth of the individual who was born into a new spiritual world the hindu philosophy is considerably more daring and logical and assumes that creation results from introversion in general as in the wonderful hymn of rigveda ten twenty nine it is said what was hidden in the shell was born through the power of fiery torments from this first arose love as the germ of knowledge the wise found the roots of existence in non-existence by investigating the heart's impulses this philosophical view interprets the world as an emanation of the libido and this must be widely accepted from the theoretic as well as the psychologic standpoint for the function of reality is an instinctive function having the character of biological adaptation when the insane schreber brought about the end of the world through his libido introversion 
he expressed an entirely rational psychologic view just as schopenhauer wished to abolish through negation holiness asceticism the error of the primal will through which the world was created does not goethe say you follow a false trail do not think that we are not serious is not the kernel of nature in the hearts of men the hero who is to accomplish the rejuvenation of the world and the conquest of death is the libido which brooding upon itself in introversion coiling as a snake around its own egg apparently threatens life with a poisonous bite in order to lead it to death and from that darkness conquering itself gives birth to itself again nietzsche knows this conception how long have you sat already upon your misfortune give heed lest you hatch an egg a basculus egg of your long travail the hero is himself a serpent himself a sacrificer and a sacrificed the hero himself is of serpent nature thereof christ compares himself with the serpent therefore the redeeming principle of the world of that gnostic sect which styled itself the ophite was the serpent the serpent is the agatho and cacko demon it is indeed intelligible when in the germanic saga they say that the heroes had serpents eyes i recall the parallel previously drawn between the eyes of the son of man and those of the tarpeian dragon in the already mentioned mediaeval pictures the dragon instead of the lord appeared in the cup the dragon who with changeful serpent glances guarded the divine mystery of renewed rebirth in the maternal womb in nietzsche the old apparently long extinct idea is again revived ailing with tenderness just as the thawing wind zarathustra sits waiting waiting on his hill sweetened and cooked in his own juice beneath his summits beneath his ice he sits weary and happy a creator on his seventh day silence it is my truth from hesitating eyes from velvety shadows her glance meets mine lovely mischievous the glance of a girl she divines the reason of my happiness she divines me ha what is she plotting a purple dragon lurks in the abyss of her maiden glance woe to thee zarathustra thou seemest like some one who has swallowed gold thy belly will be slit open in this poem nearly all the symbolism is collected which we have elaborated previously from other connections distinct traces of the primitive identity of serpent and hero are still extant in the myth of cecrops cecrops is himself half snake half man originally he probably was the athenian snake of the citadel itself as a buried god he is like erechtheus a chthonic snake god above his subterranean dwelling rises the parthenon the temple of the virgin goddess compare the analogous idea of the christian church the casting of the skin of the god which we have already mentioned in passing stands in the closest relation to the nature of the hero we have spoken already of the mexican god who casts his skin it is also told of mani the founder of the manichaean sect that he was killed skinned stuffed and hung up that is the death of christ merely in another mythological form marsyas who seems to be a substitute for attis the sun-lover of cybele was also skinned whenever a scythian king died slaves and horses were slaughtered skinned and stuffed and then set up again in phrygia the representatives of the father god were killed and skinned the same was done in athens with an ox who was skinned and stuffed and again hitched to the plough in this manner the revival of the fertility of the earth was celebrated this readily explains the fragment from the sabazios mysteries transmitted to us by firmicus in greek the bull father of the serpent and the serpent father of the bull the active fructifying upward striving form of the libido is changed into the negative force striving downwards towards death the hero as zodian of spring ram bull conquers the depths of winter and beyond the summer solstice is attacked by the unconscious longing for death 
and is bitten by the snake however he himself is the snake but he is at war with himself and therefore the descent and the end appear to him as the malicious inventions of the mother of death who in this way wishes to draw him to herself the mysteries however consolingly promise that there is no contradiction or disharmony when life is changed into death nietzsche too gives expression to this mystery here do i sit now that is i am swallowed down by this the smallest oasis it opened up just yawning its loveliest maw agape hail hail to that whale-fish when he for his guests welfare provided thus hail to his belly if he had also such a lovely oasis belly the desert grows woe to him who hides the desert stone grinds on stone the desert gulps and strangles the monstrous death gazes glowing brown and chews his life is his chewing forget not o man burnt out by lust thou art the stone the desert thou art death the serpent symbolism of the last supper is explained by the identification of the hero with the serpent the god is buried in the mother as fruit of the field as food coming from the mother and at the same time as drink of immortality he is received by the mystic or as a serpent he unites with the mystic all these symbols represent the liberation of the libido from the incestuous fixation through which new life is attained the liberation is accomplished under symbols which represent the activity of the incest wish it might be justifiable at this place to cast a glance upon psychoanalysis as a method of treatment in practical analysis it is important first of all to discover the libido lost from the control of consciousness it often happens to the libido as with the fish of moses in the mohammedan legend it sometimes takes its course in a marvellous manner into the sea freud says in his important article zur dynamik der Übertragung, the libido has retreated into regression and again revives the infantile images this means mythologically that the sun is devoured by the serpent of the night the treasure is concealed and guarded by the dragon substitution of a present mode of adaptation by an infantile mode which is represented by the corresponding neurotic symptoms freud continues thither the analytic treatment follows it and endeavours to seek out the libido again to render it accessible to consciousness and finally to make it serviceable to reality whenever the analytic investigation touches upon the libido withdrawn into its hiding-place a struggle must break out all the forces which have caused the regression of the libido will rise up as resistance against the work in order to preserve this new condition mythologically this means the hero seeks the lost son the fire the virgin sacrifice or the treasure and fights the typical fight with the dragon with the libido in resistance as these parallels show psychoanalysis mobiles a part of the life processes the fundamental importance of which properly illustrates the significance of this process after siegfried had slain the dragon he meets the father wotan plagued by gloomy cares for the primitive mother erda has placed in his path the snake in order to enfeeble his son he says to erda wanderer all wise one cares piercing sting by thee was planted in wotan's dauntless heart with fear of shameful ruin and downfall filled was his spirit by tidings thou didst foretell art thou the world's wisest of women tell to me now how a god may conquer his care erda thou art not what thou hast said it is the same primitive motive which we meet in wagner the mother has robbed her son the sun god of the joy of life through a poisonous thorn and deprives him of his power which is connected with the name isis demands the name of the god erda says thou art not what thou hast said but the wanderer has found the way to conquer the fatal charm of the mother the fear of death the eternal's downfall 
no more dismays me since their doom i willed i leave to thee loveliest volsung gladly my heritage now to thee ever young in gladness yieldeth the god these wise words contain in fact the saving thought it is not the mother who has placed the poisonous worm in our path but our libido itself wills to complete the course of the sun to mount from morn to noon and passing beyond noon to hasten towards evening not at war with itself but willing the descent and the end nietzsche zarathustra teaches i praise thee my death the free death which comes to me because i want it and when shall i want it he who has a goal and an heir wants death at the proper time for his goal and his heir and this is the great noonday when man in the middle of his course stands between man and superman and celebrates his path towards evening as his highest hope because it is the path to a new morning he who is setting will bless his own going down because it is a transition and the sun of his knowledge will be at high noon siegfried conquers the father wotan and takes possession of brunhilde the first object that he sees is her horse then he believes that he beholds a mail-clad man he cuts to pieces the protecting coat of mail of the sleeper overpowering when he sees it is a woman terror seizes him my heart doth falter and faint on whom shall i call that he may help me mother mother remember me can this be fearing o mother mother thy dauntless child a woman lieth asleep and she now has taught him to fear awaken awaken holiest maid then life from the sweetness of lips will i win me e'en though i die in a kiss in the duet which follows the mother is invoked o mother hail who gave thee thy birth the confession of brunhilde is especially characteristic o oh, knewest thou joy of the world how i have ever loved thee thou wert my gladness my care wert thou thy life i sheltered or ere it was thine or ere thou wert born my shield was thy guard the pre-existence of the hero and the pre-existence of brunhilde as his wife mother are clearly indicated from this passage siegfried says in confirmation then death took not my mother bound in sleep did she lie the mother imago which is the symbol of the dying and resurrected libido is explained by brunhilde to the hero as his own will thyself am i if blessed i be in thy love the great mystery of the logos entering into the mother for rebirth is proclaimed with the following words by brunhilde o siegfried siegfried conquering light i loved thee ever for i divined the thought that wotan had hidden the thought that i dared not to whisper that all unclearly glowed in my bosom suffered and strove for which i flouted him who conceived it for which in penance prisoned i lay while thinking it not and feeling only for in my thought oh should you guess it was only my love for thee the erotic similes which now follow distinctly reveal the motive of rebirth siegfried a glorious flood before me rolls with all my senses i only see its buoyant gladdening billows though in the deep i find not my face burning i long for the water's balm and now as i am spring in the stream o oh, might its billows engulf me in bliss the motive of plunging into the maternal water of rebirth baptism is here fully developed an allusion to the terrible mother imago the mother of heroes who teaches them fear is to be found in brunhilde's words the horsewoman who guides the dead to the other side fearest thou siegfried fearest thou not the wild furious woman the orgiastic okide moraturis resounds in brunhilde's words laughing let us be lost laughing go down to death and in the words light giving love laughing death is to be found the same significant contrast 
the further destinies of siegfried are those of the invictus the spear of the gloomy one-eyed hagen strikes siegfried's vulnerable spot the old son who has become the god of death the one-eyed wotan smites his offspring and once again ascends in eternal rejuvenation the course of the invincible sun has supplied the mystery of human life with beautiful and imperishable symbols it became a comforting fulfilment of all the yearning for immortality of all desire of mortals for eternal life man leaves the mother the source of libido and is driven by the eternal thirst to find her again and to drink renewal from her thus he completes his cycle and returns again into the mother's womb every obstacle which obstructs his life's path and threatens his ascent wears the shadowy features of the terrible mother who paralyzes his energy with the consuming poison of the stealthy retrospective longing in each conquest he wins again the smiling love and life-giving mother images which belong to the intuitive depths of human feeling the features of which have become mutilated and irrecognizable through the progressive development of the surface of the human mind the stern necessity of adaptation works ceaselessly to obliterate the last traces of these primitive landmarks of the period of the origin of the human mind and to replace them along lines which are to denote more and more clearly the nature of real objects